today's project is a big one that's taken me a long time to complete. That said, it's a project with a lot of style. Today my buddy and I are going to build a Victorian style wall panel out of this sheet of 1 quarter inch plywood. I've already made a video about how I build a standard wall panel, so if anyone is interested in learning more about that, please check out that video here. That means that I won't be going into detail about the panel frame construction in this video unless it deviates, modifies, or adds anything to the way that I build a basic wall panel. One last note that I'd like to make is that I'm going to do my best to have this video make sense. Normally, I'm by myself in my shop and it's easy to track and edit one person working on a single task at a time. Having two people doing two separate tasks at the same time and trying to edit that into a video that's easy to follow is a bit chaotic. So I'll do my best. With that out of the way, let's get caught up with what these two guys are doing. My buddy is actually more of a carpenter than I am, which is why I asked for his assistance on this project. After we went back and forth on what I wanted for the design and sorting out how best to proceed, we started by cutting out three matching holes that are equally spaced in what will become the bottom half of the wall panel. This panel is going to have classic Haunted Mansion wood paneling on the bottom half and wallpaper on the top half. Before I get too far into this project, I'd like to address the title of the video. I do realize that I'm calling this a Victorian wall panel when some of the elements of the design might not perfectly match what that implies. I am going for a look and a feel for this wall panel, not historical accuracy. I'm building a fake wall for a fake house. Fiction does not have to perfectly match with reality or history. With that being said, my goal is to create a wall design that can give someone the sense that they were transported into the setting of an old dusty and creaky haunted house. In the end, we cut out three holes that are each 10 inches wide, 33 inches tall, and are 7 and 1 quarter inches off of the bottom of the panel. The two spaces in between the holes are each 6 inches wide, with the spaces on either side being 3 inches wide. This way, when the panels are placed side by side, everything will be evenly spaced all the way across multiple panels. This is sort of a funny side note, but after we cut the holes in the plywood, my buddy Jason says, now we need to attach it to a frame to do the decorative boards. And I said, what frame? I didn't think that we would need one until later after the decorative boards were done, so we had to whip one up really quickly. With the plywood prepped and secured to a frame, it's time to start making my own decorative trim boards from scratch. Truth be told, at the start of this project, I didn't own a router table, much less know how to use one. Normally, something like this would be made from a high quality type of wood. I don't have money for high quality, so I'm using much more affordable pine boards. The parts that we're working on now, I'm going to refer to as the inner trim boards. I'll explain exactly what I mean by that a little later on. So it turns out that this router bit is pretty dull, and Jason was having a bit of a rough go at using it on these boards. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a replacement at the store that matched. After thinking about it for a bit, we decided that we would use a different router bit that has a similar shape, but doesn't have the same details, to hog out the bulk of the material. And then we would go back with the older router bit, and do a second pass that would add the details. This way, the dull router bit doesn't have to do as much of the heavy lifting, and we don't have to make any sacrifices on our design. This is the pass with the detail router bit. The board on the top is the first pass, the board on the bottom is the second. Doing things this way made everything so much smoother and significantly easier to do instead of trying to force the board through while using a dull router bit. Next up, Jason is going to work on the outer trim boards. These are a bit more complex and will need several different passes on the router table with different router bits to make them. These skinny boards are actually leftover bits from when we cut the inner trim boards. This first pass adds detail to the front of the board. The second pass rounds over the back of the board. Jason and I did things in a little bit different order from one another, so here's a better look at the cut the router bit makes.
The design of this panel uses quite a bit of this type of the trim board, so we actually ended up making a lot of it. This last pass makes a notch on the bottom so that the front can hang over the edge of the plywood and cover it. Initially, we were cutting out the full amount of the notch, but unfortunately, it was causing the boards to splinter. So we ended up doing two passes to keep this from happening. The first pass would start the notch, and the second would hog out the rest of the material. Here is an example of how the boards were splintering. It won't stop me from using this though. I mean, it is for a haunted house after all. When we were making these trim boards, we went ahead and made enough to build upwards of 10 of these 4 foot by 8 foot panels, which is enough for a nice sized room in my Haunted Mansion themed haunted house. I figured that there wasn't much sense in setting up the router table in a specific way to make just enough parts for this one panel, only to come back at a later date and try to perfectly match what we did the first time around. This way, we do the one setup and make all the parts that we'll need in one go. There is a spot on the bottom of the wood paneling that we're doing that requires a special version of the outer trim board. This is a little montage of Jason sorting out exactly how to make that piece the right way. And I'll show an example of that a little later on. Now for the last step in our parts preparation. I cut several 3 inch strips out of a scrap piece of 1 quarter inch plywood. These pieces will help sell the illusion of the wood paneling and make it look as though the panels are more than just sheets of plywood. Finally, we can get to assembling this thing. Before I get into that, I'd like to briefly show some close-ups that will explain what each of us are working on. Firstly, I'm going through and marking all of the inner trim boards at 1 and 1 quarter inches from the back. Then, I'm marking one side with a 45 degree angle. Then I take that board and place it into the hole in the panel, line up where my two lines intersect with the corner, and mark the other side across the first line that I made. Then I draw another 45 degree angle that intersects with that mark, and I'm ready to cut the board. After they're cut, I hand them over to Jason so he can glue and nail them into the panel. Alrighty, back to the regularly scheduled panel build, already in progress. I just want to say that it was really nice having someone here in my shop to help me out on this project. Especially somebody who knows what they're doing and I don't have to look over his shoulder every few minutes to see if he's doing things the way that I want them. Basically, it was nice being able to mark and cut the boards, I could hand them over to him, and I know that they're going to be nailed to the panel in the right spot. With the top row of inner trim boards in place, it's time to work on the middle section. Basically, the steps are the same as before, just in the middle. When I started this project, I really wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. Sure, I know how to build stuff, but I don't really do precision woodworking. I didn't know how to use a router table at the beginning of this, and now I've used it on several projects since then. There was also a learning curve for Jason to learn how I build portable wall panels versus building something to permanently be in someone's house. Next, we're going to install the sides of the inner trim boards. To do this, I measure the distance between the inside of the two trim boards that are already installed. Then I mark a board with a 45 degree angle and measure that same distance from the inside of that mark. Using that mark, I draw an opposite 45 degree angle starting from that point. Then I cut the board, and it's ready to glue and nail into the panel. And we're done with the inner trim boards on the top three squares.
With the inner trim boards done on the top three squares, Jason's working out how to cut the outer trim boards to fit. The outer trim boards go on the face of the plywood panel, as well as wrap around the edge of the plywood. This will help disguise the fact that this is plywood and not planks of oak or walnut. To cut these boards to size, I start by cutting one side with a 45 degree angle. Then I put it in place in the square, and use the seam from the inner trim boards to make a mark. Then I flip it over, mark an opposite 45 degree angle, and cut it. Then I check to see if it fits, and cut the other three trim pieces. As Jason cuts the outer trim boards, I'm finishing cutting up and attaching the inner trim boards that go in the three larger rectangles. The process for making those is the same as the ones that I showed from before. One of my cameras stopped recording, so I had to climb up and start fussing with it. As I finished up attaching the inner trim boards inside the large rectangles, Jason could now start cutting the outer trim boards for those large rectangles. This is where the special piece of outer trim board comes in that I mentioned earlier. Because of how we designed the paneling and the baseboard, we had to make this little piece of half of the front of the outer trim board. Then we had to cut these funny angles into it to make everything look nice and clean. Kind of like we had the slightest idea of what we're doing. And with that, my two days of having Jason help me with this project are up. As well as the battery on my remaining camera just died. A round of applause please for Jason, he will be back for the reveal at the end of the video. With the inner trim boards all done and the outer trim boards all cut to size, it's just a matter of gluing everything together. It was a little slow going at first because I only had enough of these types of clamps to glue down one board at a time. But as I was working on this, I kept going back to the store to buy more clamps to speed things up a bit. Also, you can never have too many clamps. Ever. The reason that I opted to glue them instead of using my nail gun is because I didn't want to run the risk of the boards splitting. They were already prone to splintering when we were running them through the router table. As well as Jason and I spent way too much time on these just for me to ruin them. Next up, I'm going to work on the baseboard. When coming up with this design, I had to try to make sure that I didn't add any more than 3 quarters of an inch to the front face of the panel. Which is how thick one of these pine boards are. The reason for this is that I need to be able to stack them as efficiently as possible when they go into storage on the off season. That means that I had to design a baseboard that looks good, but doesn't stick out off of the panel any further than that 3 quarter inch limit. With the design cut into the board, I can now glue it to the panel. I used a combination of finishing nails and lots of clamps to get the board to lay flat to the panel. I didn't like how the finishing nails were holding it down, so I added more clamps. With the baseboard securely in place, I can finish adding the outer trim boards to the large rectangles. Even with buying more clamps, it's still taking me forever to finish gluing these trim boards down.
All right, the last rectangle. Just four more pieces of trim boards and it's on to the next part of this build. Next, I need to use my angle grinder to grind down the finishing nails that are sticking through the back side of the trim boards. Now I can mark out on these pieces of plywood where the openings are in the middle of the attached trim boards. I need to know where the holes are in the rectangles in relation to the pieces of plywood so I can correctly place the next element of this design. As I go through and mark the corners of each rectangle onto the plywood, I make sure to number everything so that I know where they go later on. The screws that I'm using to temporarily hold them in place will eventually be used as registration markers for when they're permanently attached to the panel. With the last piece of plywood being marked, I can start working on the pieces of pine board that will make the next part of the design. These boards are 8 inches wide, however, here in America, an 8 inch board is actually 7.5 inches across for some reason. This will leave me with about a 3 8 inch gap on either side when they are placed between the inner trim boards that are attached to the panel. The lengths of the boards have been measured to have the same 3 8 inch gap along the tops and bottoms as well. Once all of the boards were cut to length, I had to run them through my router table several times to get the desired depth of the cut. Although this router bit is brand new and sharp, it was still easier and less damaging to the boards to do this particular cut in increments as opposed to all at once. This means that after I ran all four sides of all six boards through the router table, I would move the backboard back about an eighth of an inch and do it all again. I also ended up making a modification for the backstop of my router table. I added a piece of plywood with a hole in it that is very close to the size of the router bit. I did this because some of the pieces that I'm making are too small to make it across the large opening in the normal backstop. As the pieces would pass by that large opening, they would wobble and make an irregular cut. This way, the cuts are nice and smooth. A little anecdote is that due to the close tolerances between the router bit and the backstop modification, when I would have my vacuum turned on to collect the sawdust, it would make a bit of an air raid siren sound due to the spinning of the blade and the air being pulled past it. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of all of the cuts. Now that I have all of my decorative boards cut from the router bit, it's time to go through, sand everything up, and smooth out any bumps or imperfections. For this, I used all kinds of different sandpapers and sanding pads. First, I would go through and use my mouse sander to knock down any large bumps, and then I would use sandpaper and sanding pads to give everything a smooth finish. In the past, I found that wood stains highlight the swirls in the surface of the wood that get left behind by orbital sanders. That's why I'm going through and sanding everything by hand with a finer grit sandpaper and sanding pads. I also make sure to sand everything with the grain of the wood as much as possible to hopefully clean up any cross grain sanding marks. With all of the sanding done, it's time to attach these decorative pieces to the sheets of plywood. I do this by centering the boards between the marks that were taken from the panel and then marking where the decorative board sits. Then I drill some holes, lay down some glue, and carefully screw the board to the plywood making sure that nothing shifts as the screws are tightened. The screws that I'm using are little 1 half inch Phillips head screws. They're short enough that with the plywood being 1 quarter of an inch thick, they just barely grip into the pine board. This way, I don't have to worry about them punching their way through the decorative board on the other side. I do, however, have to be very careful that I don't over tighten them because they'll easily strip out the pine board and they won't be able to hold the boards together tightly as the glue dries.
Now it's finally time to attach these decorative pieces to the rest of the panel. I run a bead of glue around the edge of the plywood pieces and screw them down with one and one quarter inch screws. I made sure to try to line up my placement of the screws with the outer trim boards on the front of the panel. That way, if I accidentally countersunk one of them a little bit too far, it wouldn't end up sticking out on the other side of the panel. With all of the decorative pieces attached, it's time to flip it over and start prepping for the wood stain. That means sanding. Lots and lots of sanding. It's the most thrilling, and basically everyone's second most favorite part of my videos, just behind endless hours of watching me paint something several coats of paint. Is that foreshadowing? Take a guess. I also went over the whole panel, sunk down any finishing nails, and applied putty to any nails, cracks, or seams that I felt needed it. After I left the putty to dry for a few days, I sanded off any excess and smoothed everything out with a fine grit sanding pad. This is a good example of why I sanded these decorative pieces before I attached them to the panel. They were much easier to work with without all the extra stuff in the way. So before I put any stain on the panel, I did a bunch of testing. As I mentioned earlier, this kind of paneling is likely made of oak or walnut or some other type of medium to hard wood. Those types of wood are much better at accepting wood stain on the end of the wood grain and having an even color throughout. The pine that I used though, well, doesn't do that. It soaks up a lot of stain on the end wood grain and makes it much darker. I did however come up with a process to combat that a bit. The first step that I did to help the ends of these decorative boards look better with the wood stain was to carefully brush in a coat of this pre-stained wood conditioner, but I only brushed it into the end grain of these boards and nowhere else. After I let the wood conditioner dry, I moved on to doing the same thing with a single coat of this clear satin acrylic urethane. Once again, I carefully brushed it into only the end grain of the decorative boards. I didn't need to apply it to anywhere else on the panel because all the other end grains were covered. With all of the decorative boards prepped, I can finally move on to applying the wood stain. I chose Minwax's Honey 272 color because I felt that it would complement the colors in the wallpaper that I picked out. Once I finished everything on the bottom half of the panel, I let the stain soak for about 20 to 30 minutes before wiping off the excess. After I wiped off all of the excess stain, it was a bit lighter than I was hoping for, so I applied a second coat. After I let that coat sit for another 20 to 30 minutes, I tried wiping it off to see how it turned out. After I was satisfied with how the stain turned out, it was time to paint the top half of the panel with a special wallpaper primer. It's a lot thicker than the usual primer and almost has the consistency of pancake batter. With the top half of the panel painted with primer, I can now start spraying the clear gloss on the lower half. Bear with me, this is going to take a while. I put so many coats of paint on this thing. I really wanted to protect the wood from any potential moisture damage. Okay, now I start using the sprayer. I don't know if I have it set the wrong way, but it really filled up my shop with a paint mist very quickly. 
I'm really glad I was wearing that respirator. I didn't sand between the first three coats because I wanted to build up a solid paint layer before I started sanding. I didn't want to accidentally sand through the paint and ended up having to redo portions of the wood stain. Now that I have a solid three layers of paint, I can start sanding and prepping the wood paneling for the final few layers of clear coat. The sanding on this thing took quite a while to do. There are a lot of corners and angles on it, and I want to make sure that I do this project right. With the sanding finished, I spray all of the dust off with my air hose. Now that the majority of the painting of the wood paneling is done, I can finally move on to laying down some wallpaper. Normally, the wallpaper that I've used in the past has been what is called double wide, which is generally about 22 inches wide. The wallpaper that I bought for this project is quadruple wide, which puts it about 44 inches wide. Which is great, but it unfortunately doesn't come as pre-pasted, which means that it doesn't have water activated glue already on it. No matter though, I have wallpaper glue and a plastic tool thingy. As far as how I'm laying down the wallpaper, I'm setting it back about 3 eighths of an inch on each side and I'm cutting it so that it will be underneath the chair rail and the crown molding. The idea being that I want the wallpaper to be held down by the trim boards. Hopefully, this will stop the wallpaper from peeling up in the corners if it happens to get any moisture on it. I lightly sprayed the back of the wallpaper with water so that it would loosen up and be a bit easier to work with. Once I laid down the wallpaper, I used my wallpaper spreader to squeeze out any air bubbles and excess wallpaper glue. With the wood paneling painted and the wallpaper laid down, the last steps are to build the remaining trim pieces. This includes the chair rail, the crown molding, and two side trim boards. Right now, I'm working on the chair rail. I had to run this board through two different router bits to get the design that I was looking for. With the board cut the way that I like, it's time for some sanding, some wood stain, and some clear coat. You know the drill. I had to keep staining and re-staining this board to finally get the color that I was after. It kept coming out much lighter than I wanted. Now that I got the chair rail to match the color of the wood paneling, I needed to cut the ends with a router bit so that it could fit into the curve of the trim boards that will be on either side of this panel. This cut is the positive shape that will fit into the negative space of the side trim boards. Next, I'll be working on the multitude of pieces that will make up what I designed for the crown molding. The crown molding will consist of two parts. The first part will be permanently attached to the panel. The second part will be removable and make the storage of these panels more economical. This large board is the piece that will be permanently attached to the panel. The top half of it will be covered by the removable section, so I only need to detail part of it.
Before I apply the wood stain to this, I'll make the rest of the trim boards that I'll need and then I'll stain and paint all of them at the same time. The next few boards that I'll be making are for the removable portion of the crown molding. This first board is for the back half of the crown molding and will have the bolt holes drilled into it that will allow it to temporarily attach to the panel. Similar to the larger board, only the bottom portion of this board will be visible. This board is the front facing board for the crown molding. I ended up having to run it through the router table several different times with three different router bits to get the look that I was going for. I also needed it to have 45 degree angles on both sides. I only cut one of these angles before applying the wood stain because it would be facing down where it might be seen. I also opted to stain the boards individually for the most part to try to minimize the wood stain collecting in between the boards and making a dark line down the length of it. It sure is a fancy design, isn't it? Next up are the two trim boards that will be on either side of the panel. So, the reasoning I have behind this is that I hate visible seams when I assemble my wall panels. For me, it takes away from the illusion when I'm easily able to tell that the room that I'm in is a collection of 4 foot wide sections. My solution for this is to make the seam part of the design and hide it by drawing attention to it. If it looks like it's supposed to be there, the brain won't think twice about it. Since these boards are going from top to bottom on either side of the panel, I have to cut a negative space into the ends of them so that they can fit with the positive cuts on the baseboard and the crown molding. I had to run them through the router table twice to get the cut to be at the desired depth. Now that I have my parts prepped, I can start staining and painting them. When I was staining this board, I intentionally didn't put any on the top half of it. The reason being is that since the full crown molding is a separate part, I wanted it to look bad or like something was missing. This way, if I ever have a crew helping me assemble my haunted house, they'll hopefully be with it enough to come ask me why the top of the panel doesn't look as nice as the rest of it. That way, we won't make it all the way to opening night with parts missing. I had to stain some of these boards multiple times to get them to match the wood paneling, but they're slowly getting there. I almost forgot to make one last little piece for the crown molding, so I'll just throw that in here. To be able to assemble my parts for the crown molding, I had to make these little triangle parts. It was very scary to make them. Now I get to assemble all of the components for the removable part of the crown molding. I space out the little triangles at 16 inches apart and secure them in place with finishing nails. With the triangles attached to the board that is the front of the crown molding, I can now assemble the two boards together.
Well, I guess after quite a bit of measuring and tinkering, I can assemble them together. I had to be very careful with these screws that I didn't accidentally punch through the front of the board. This last little board is the one that I almost forgot to make from earlier. With this part fully assembled, I can do a little putty to cover all of the finishing nails and do a little bit of sanding and then it'll be time for paint. I do one last coat of wood stain to blend in the wood putty and it's on to the next step. Now, it's finally time for the absolute best and action-packed part of the video. It's yours truly, putting what is essentially way too many coats of paint on all the parts that I've been making. So strap in, cuz this is gonna take a while. Sorry. Basically, the reason that I put so many coats of paint on everything is because the haunted attraction that I've done in the past has always been an outdoor event. Which means that either during setup, the run of the show, or teardown, there's going to be some rainy weather. I may spend lots of time building these things, but I build them to last, and I build them so that I only have to build them once. All of the stuff that I build is going to outlive me, and I hope that it's still in use long after I'm gone. And if I've done a good enough job building it, that'll be a guarantee that someone will be using it for years and years. I have a little anecdote that I'd like to share. I don't know if anyone else has this association that I have with this particular smell, but for me, the smell of fresh latex paint makes me think of haunted houses. I think that it's because I've spent so many hundreds of hours painting panels for haunted houses. So does anyone else have that, or is that just me? Originally, I wasn't going to sand any of these parts because the finishes on them came out so smoothly without sanding, but I couldn't help myself. With all of the painting nearly complete, I can finally move on to the final assembly of all of these trim boards onto the panel. To make things easier on myself, I mark and drill pilot holes in the panel for the screws that will be screwed into the crown molding from the back. I also temporarily place the side trim boards in their spots to make sure that the crown molding will be nailed down in its correct spot. I nailed the board down with a few finishing nails to hold it in place while I clamp it. Next, I flip the panel up on its side and screw down the trim board from the back. I check the front and wipe off any squeeze out with a damp paper towel. These holes are how the removable crown molding will bolt to the panel. Because the side trim boards are so thin, I went with gluing them in place instead of using the nail gun with the finishing nails. I also used silicone seal on the end of the boards to make a watertight seal. I again checked the front of the boards and cleaned any squeeze out with a damp paper towel. 
I then repeated all of the same steps on the other side of the panel. The last trim board. This is it. I marked and drilled pilot holes across the middle of the panel, clamped the chair rail in place, and put screws in from the other side of the panel. And with that, all of the decorative parts are on this panel. There is just a bit more touching up to do, and it'll be finished. Like more painting! Ha! You thought there wasn't going to be any painting left, but there's actually so much more painting left to do. But first, I need to cut the special board for the frame and install it. I thought that this board was going to be more difficult to make, but it ended up being much easier to do than I had originally anticipated. Since the panel is fully finished on the front, I had to attach the 2x4 to the plywood from the back by using some 3 inch long screws. For the final, final step, the back of the panel gets two coats of semi-gloss black paint. Originally, we used flat black paint on the backs of the panels, but we switched to the semi-gloss because it kept the mildew from growing on the panels when they were in storage on the off-season. Well, I don't really have much to add here in the wrap up. When the video is over 45 minutes long, there's really not much else to say. A note that I'd like to make is that I've already started working on a second one of these panels when I have a minute in between other projects. I also have plans for these panels, so you'll be seeing a lot of them in future videos. So I hope you like my wall panel, and I'll see you all next time. watching.